Amen. All right. Um, so, by way of reminder, last week we talked about um, where man was created. We spent a significant amount of time talking about and referencing sources uh, to demonstrate that humanity began in Africa, um, specifically uh, in East Africa. One of the things that I learned in my own personal studies is that there's a bit of a debate about where at in Africa uh, humanity began. And some say South Africa and some say East Africa. Well, tonight I think we're going to be able to um, be able to say that both are correct. Okay. All right. So our verse verses that we're that that are our anchor verses are Genesis 1, uh, 26 through 28, and Genesis 2, 6 through 8. And I'll read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in verse 27 in his own image, the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Chapter two, verse six. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man in verse seven of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. All right. So in uh, chapter one, we see that God created man in, uh, in his image and after his likeness. And so image speaks of appearance, likeness speaks of power and authority, okay? We see, uh, we see that demonstrated, uh, particularly likeness where he says, and let them have dominion over uh, all, these, all these things, okay? Image, it says that God uh, reached down and picked up some mud, okay? He took some mud, he shaped it about uh, five foot 10, five foot 11, whatever that is, uh, mud, he shaped it up. And then uh, once it dried in the very hot sun, he breathed on it. First lady, good evening, how are you? Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you on mute. But, uh, oh, no, she's a, I'm doing well. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so God took mud, formed it, let it dry, in this very hot sun, breathed on it, and that mud became a living soul. Now, I'm using specific terminology for, for, for a reason. I said mud. The scripture says that God formed man from the dust of the ground, right? But you understand this dust was watered from beneath. So this dust was not dry. This dust was moist. Not only that, we discovered last week in places like Isaiah chapter 40, that dust is not just the fine particles of dirt that are in the air. It represents the entire ground, okay? So God took muddy dirt or wet dirt and formed it and made man, okay? Um, and then the, my bonus thought was, in your experience, uh, have you seen what color has dirt been in your experience? Have you ever experienced dirt that did not look like you? Just, okay. All right, so now we're going to move on into uh, Eden, where Eden is <clears throat> and the evidence to support that Eden resides in Africa. Uh, just a second. 
on the fan it's getting a little warm okay Aaron is still at work uh, he's still at work all right so let's talk about the description of Eden <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 2 verses 10 through 15 we read and a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and, and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is that which compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That was Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. So in this description of Eden, the Holy Spirit gives us some information that we can use to be able to discern where Eden resides. The first description he gives us is a river that comp that compasses the whole land of Havilah. So you might be asking yourself, well, what is Havilah? That's not a city or town or a location or a region I've ever heard of. Well, if you go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 7, Genesis 10, verse 7, it says, And the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah and Sapta and Rama and Saptika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Okay, so here we are. Again, the Holy Spirit is giving us information about, about uh, the location of Eden. We see that Havilah is actually a son of Cush, right? Uh, last week, we talked about the fact that Cush is Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia is a Greek word that is in two parts, and it, the Greek word literally means black face. Okay, so Ethiopia is black face. Uh, as we continue, we'll find out that the land of Cush, uh, we'll just go there right now. So the land of Cush. So what is the land of Cush? Genesis 10, 7 is probably the most important verse in the Bible for the purposes of identifying the location of the Garden of Eden. This is because it groups Cush and Havilah together as son and grandson of Ham, the African hot countries. Eden was therefore a place in the region of the historically famous Cush. The Jewish Heritage Online magazine gives us a more precise location of Cush rather than the generalized location of Ethiopia. And I read, although there are other biblical associations, Cush generally refers to the uh, refers in the Bible to Nubia in a region south of Egypt, corresponding roughly to present day Nalatic Sudan. The, and if this is the case here too, then Pison and Gihon may be the terms of the Blue Nile and White Nile. Uh, these two rivers unite at Katurum to form the mightiest river of Africa. So I'll repeat, this author says uh, that, uh, that the rivers Pison and Gihon may actually refer to the Blue and White Nile, making reference to the fact that Cush uh, is a Nubian land. OK, now, one of the things to bear in mind is when we read when we read in places like Genesis chapter 10, it talks about the descendants of Ham, Shem and Japheth. The Bible, you'll probably see it seems at the top of your Bible is called the Table of Nations. It's not necessarily, although it is talking about actual descendants, um, Ham had these children but it's making a much larger point of that these are geographical locations, okay? So Cush is a geographical location, all right? Um, I wanna show you, I'm gonna share my screen and show you, uh, la, 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 la. let me see if I can do this.
Okay, let me share my screen. All right, can y'all see that? Yes. Okay. This is modern uh, Africa. This is a political map of modern Africa. Can you see the whole thing? Or did they make it smaller? Okay. Yes, no, I see it. Okay, so I just want to point out, you see here, Ethiopia, little tiny area of Africa. That was not the case in the past. In fact, we're going to, as we read, we're going to discover that, uh, that Cush, the land of Cush, was everything south of Egypt. So everything down here south of Egypt along the eastern border, all of that was Cush. Hmm. All of this is Cush. Uh, this is a 1592 map of Abyssinia by Abraham Ortulius. Okay, like I said, I'm, I'll provide I'll provide this uh, for you guys to have that you can just hold hold or read separately. All right, all right. Okay, um, there's a Bible dictionary called Easton's. Past, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Easton's Bible dictionary agrees uh, that Cush is primarily Nubia the land south of Egypt, and give some details about an Asiatic co uh, concept of Cush. So one of the things, and Pastor, I don't know if, you, if you've come across this in your biblical studies, a lot of times you're going to see it, um, scholars will make an association that some of these Cushite locations may have actually been in Arabia. Uh, they, they, yeah, they've tried to make the connection. Okay. Um, yeah. But there's a logical reason why they do it, although they, although it's faulty. Um, and so one of the logical reasons why is because under Shem, you see two, you see three of, the, of Ham's children named. So under Shem's line, under Jockton, and, uh, and then subsequently under Abraham, you see three of these names appear, right? And so that's why they're trying to make the association over on the opposite side of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, right? But we're going to see that there is no reason to make that leap whatsoever, okay? Uh, where did I stop? Good. All right, from him, that is the land of Cush, seems to have been derived its name. The question of the precise locality of the land of Cush has given rise to not a little controversy. We just discussed that. The second river of paradise surrounds the whole land of Cush, Genesis 2, 13 in the RV. The term Cush in the Old Testament generally applies to the country south of the Israelites. It was the southern limit of, of Egypt. According to Ezekiel 29, Ethiopia, Hebrews, Cush, with which it was generally associated, Psalm 68, 31, Isaiah 18, 1, Jeremiah 46, 9, etc. It stands also associated with Elam. So here, the authors of the Easton's Dictionary are making a jump over to, over to, the, over to uh, Saudi Arabia, okay? Elam, which was a son of Shem. Uh, <clears throat> with Persia and with the uh, Sabaeans and Isaiah. All right, from these facts, it has been inferred that Cush included Arabia and the country on the west coast of the Red Sea. Rawlinson takes it to be the country still known as Kazakhstan on the east side of the lower Tigris, but there are intimations which warrant the, conclu the conclusion that this was also Cush in Africa, the Ethiopia so-called by the Greeks, of Africa. So in other words, what he's saying is, while it uses, while there's references to uh, families that are from the line of Shem, which puts them squarely in Saudi Arabia, it cannot be ignored that there's also a Kush association in Africa. So I just want to give you both sides of the argument, okay? You're going to come across some folks that are much smarter than me, uh, and they're going to say, no, nah, that's over there in Saudi Arabia. And so you'll just be better prepared to be able to answer them 
um, as we go on. Mm -hmm. So again, the argument that we're placing is that uh, number one, Eden is in the eastern portion of Africa. The eastern portion of Africa is called the land of Cush. Okay. It, it's everything south of Egypt, all the way down to the, uh, to the, uh, the southernmost part of, of the continent. Okay. All right. Um, because Eden has in its description, Havala, let's see if there is a association with Havala and the rest of these location uh, with Cush. So we're going to start with Siva. Seba uh, is, uh, this is strongly supported by Isaiah 43.3. I'm sorry, let me start over. And Isaiah 43.3, it says, For I am the Lord thy God, the labor of Egypt, and the merchandise of Ethiopia, and of the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over unto, unto thee, and they shall be thine. The word Sabaeans is translated of Hebrew, Sabaeam. Uh, which is the plural form of Seba. Seba is one of Cush's children, right? And because we're talking about territories, uh, we should see Seba and Cush related somewhere in the Ethiopic region, the Nubian region. Mm. Are y'all tracking with me? Okay. All right. Good, 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 good. It appears to refer to a nation sharing a border with Cush, just as Cush shares a border with Egypt. Smith's Bible Dictionary expands on this. Seba heads the list of sons of Cush. Besides the mention of Seba and the list of the sons of Cush, Genesis 10:7, um, and First Chronicles chapter one verse nine. There are but three notices of the nation, Psalms chapter 72, verse 10, Isaiah 42, 3, and 45, 14. These passages seem to show that Seba was a nation of Africa bordering on or including in Cush and in Solomon's time, independent and of political importance. It may perhaps be identified with the island of Moreau. We're going to come back to that island of Moreau. The island of Moreau between the Astaboras and the Atarba, the most northern tributary of the Nile and Seba, I'm sorry, uh, and, and the Seba. Okay, that's referenced from Smith's Bible Dictionary. Again, all these references will be in the study, which will be available on groups. All right, the next. Uh, the next territory, Kushite territory, is Havala. Havala, which was specifically mentioned as having an association with Eden. There are two Havalas in Genesis. Uh, one can be found in Genesis 10, 26 through 30, where, uh, where this one is one of 13 sons of Joktan, including Sheba and an Orpher, uh, excuse me, Orpher among them. So Joktan is a great, great grandson of Shem, which is a, uh, um, a great, great grandson of, of uh, grandfather, excuse me, of Abraham. Okay. So this is where, this is where our, our scholars begin to begin, uh, get an association that uh, Eden resided in Mesopotamia, right, over in and around Saudi Arabia, okay? <clears throat> in Genesis 25, 18, the descendant of Ab uh, Abraham's son, Ishmael, are described as occupying the land from Havala to Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest towards Assyria, okay? That's in Genesis 25, 18. The Havala that concerns the Eden narrative, however, is the son of Cush. The only biblical verse that describes the location of this Havala is the one mentioning the river Pison flowing through this land as a counterpart of the river, of, excuse me, the river Gihon, which flows through Cush. So our already used logic strongly suggests that Havala will be in the neighborhood of this historically famous Cush. Okay? 
So we're, regardless of the fact that there are other Havilas that are named that follow a different bloodline, it makes no difference because we see an association with Kush and Havila and Eden in Africa, not Saudi Arabia, okay? Hey, Louis. Yes, sir. Um, I was going to say that I uh, some of the conclusions is this just for for us to chew on some of the conclusions often that we say scholars arrived at was really more so an issue of um, I guess the tail the tail wagging the dog right. um, in, in, in that it was really far less educated people that were influencing the narrative, the, the, uh, the storyline. And the reason for that was it had everything to do with, again, the white dominant narrative. Absolutely. All right. So, Absolutely. and so I'm very careful, you know, um, a lot of people, a lot of preachers love Matthew Henry commentaries, but there's, there's, there's so much of a white dominant narrative in a lot of the commentaries. And, and um, I don't know how much of that. I know Calandria recently finished uh, her master's in, in uh, um, oh, good grief, biblical leadership or, or, or uh, church leadership. But and I don't know if, if you've been exposed to that, but it's that's just the reality that it's a it's a lot of the tail wagging the dog. And so a lot of what Lewis is talking about, the tail wagging the dog narrative is what took flight. And and I know. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is, um, is everybody clear on um, Lewis is unpacking a lot of information about about Kush. Is everybody clear on why he's doing this? OK. OK, Coach, can somebody can somebody tell me in in 10 seconds why why this is so important? Kush. Because of its location and it's somewhat is a well, it is a verification of possibly where Eden is um, in relationship to um, genealogy and landmass. Because you know, when you look at the maps, and we all know that as uh, landmasses change either through man-made doing things like blocking water or letting water go. And when, they, um, when they're conquering different lands, because you know, when I'm looking at the map of Arabia and Judah and all that stuff, it looks like it could have been, it's probably part of Africa at the time. They just separated with the Suez <laughs> Canal or whatever they did, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I understand what he's doing as he's unpacking it, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and again, what I would say is Kush, the territory was broad and it was black. And, and that's what Lewis is, is, is taking us on this journey. It was broad and it was black. You don't remember nothing else. Uh, it was broad and it was black. And, and it included Eden in that. Yes. Um, I'll leave references to other notes that, um, that I did not include uh, in, in the study. But one of the things to bear in mind, broad and black, is that the, the, the territory between Egypt and um, uh, Kush of old, there was varying scales of blackness. The author, uh, of this Eden book that I'm getting a lot of my quotes from has been there and he's from, from an archaeological perspective and he's looked at and he says that Egyptians, uh, Egyptians were from a Nubian's perspective considered white. And I mm -hmm. think this is how they're trying to make a obviously a universal leap that Egyptians were white because they see that sort of language in their writings, right? But it wasn't that they were white as much as Nubians are, think of the darkest black you can think of, like blue black. That's Kushites. 
Kushites were jet dark blue black, but the range of black across the region was from, like I said, from blue black to like a maho uh, mahogany, ebony, and uh, up to it, including uh, red bone. She's a huckiness. Okay, <laughs> up to <laughs> up to and including uh, caramel colors. So, uh, and this is before any admixture. Okay, so this is before any, uh, any, uh, any, uh, well, obviously before any white because it wasn't any white there. And let me just say this here, just to, one last thing about what the thought that uh, Pastor was bringing up. The Bible is Afrocentric, okay? There's, a, there's an, an idea that the Bible is Eurocentric, that, that the Bible is European in origin. The characters of the Bible are European in origin. And that's what we're dispelling right now. We just want to show the truth, right? And so if the truth was that the Bible was Eurocentric, then that's what we would be saying tonight on this session. But the Bible is not Eurocentric, it's Afrocentric, okay? And it's Oh, the evidence is replete. It's over and over and over. Uh, the evidence is just insurmountable that it's Afrocentric. Okay. All right. <clears throat> We're talking about Havilah. The Bible says the river Pison encompassed all the lands of Havilah. Havilah is the name of the sons of Cush, who probably settled near his family's origin. Plentiful gold, delium, and onyx minerals have been found along the banks of the river that the Romans later called the White Nile. Huh, interesting. So the description that God told Moses that he penned down in the second chapter of Genesis that it has gold and delium and onyx is verified by the Romans. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, the river Gihon can pass the whole land of Ethiopia, uh, which when you see Ethiopia in your Bible, it is because that is a translation of Cush. I think it's a little bit, and I'm going to say it this way here. Uh, nope, I won't say it at all. Never mind. Um, it should have been rendered Cush and not Ethiopia, particularly in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Ethiopia makes sense, right? Because the New Testament is written in Greek. But in the Old Testament, it should have been rendered Cush and not Ethiopia. Uh, so the river Gihon compasses the whole land of Ethiopia and most likely refers to the Blue Nile. Uh, <laughs> Although the names Pison and Gihon have been lost in antiquity, the biblical reference strongly suggests that these Edenic rivers were indeed the same rivers that flow through present day Sudan. Okay? Okay. All right. Um, a couple of other commentators, Kyle and the Leash, in their Old Testament biblical commentary, link the Avalate with another group known to the Greeks, descendants of Cush, Siva, the inhabitants of Miro. Okay. So again, uh, we've got commentators, some of which who, who are just treating the text honestly, are saying, listen, we can see there is an there is uh, an Avala group that is that are descendants of Cush. Uh, and this is also confirmed by the Greeks, all right? All right, let's move on to, uh, let's move on to Sapta. So I'm gonna to try to touch all of these children so that we can get just clear evidence that uh, Eden resided in a Kushite area of Africa. Uh, Sabta and the list of sons of Cush, Havilah is followed by Sabta. Josephus gives us a clue as to the locality of their region. Uh, 
Sabaths founded the Sabath, the Sabbathines. Yeah, Sabbathines. They are Josephus. Who is Josephus? Great question. So Josephus is a uh, Jewish historian who lived uh, who lived right after the death of Christ. Okay. Okay. And can I just be a little clearer? Uh, I, I use I, I'm using safe language when I use the word Jewish. Um, Jewish is not the term that I would use for someone who is a Hebrew who is living at that time. Uh, the letters I-S-H mean kind of, but not really, like the show Blackish, right? So Jewish being having the same connotation, right? They're like Jews, but they are not. They're Jews by virtue of conversion and not by blood. So Josephus was a Jew. All right. Um, so Josephus said, let me get back to where I was. Um, Sabathes founded the Sabathines. They are now called by the Greeks Astaborans. And that's found in his book of antiquities. Uh, you'll see the reference. The Astaborans dwelt around the Astaborus River referred to earlier. Strabo, which is another commentator, reminds us of the location of the river. The greatest royal seat is, uh, is um, Mero, a city bearing the same name as the island. It has copper, iron, gold, and different kinds of precious stones. It is bounded on the Libyan side by large dunes. At, uh, uh, so this guy is making the Arabian argument as well. So one of the things, and because so I don't have to keep going back and forth. I think it, to be honest about an Arabian association, hmm. before the flood, before the flood, it was very likely that all the water was gathered together into one place, just like the Bible says. Okay. So that water was in one place and dry land was in another place. What you see when you look at a picture of the map of the world is water in several places, right? Scattered all about and land and interspersed throughout water. It is plausible that before the flood, all the land was together. All the water was in one place, just like the Bible describes. So then, uh, so then, because of continental connectivity or pre-continental drift post-flood uh, and to end the antediluvian period, it is very possible that all of that could have been connected, right? As a landmass. All right. So I, I'm trying to give, I'm trying to give these scholars the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they know all this stuff and they're, and they're saying it, uh, <clears throat> not to say that they, it, they're not trying to whitewash because because they are, they are trying to whitewash it, but just to give them some benefit. So going on, uh, so uh, say, uh, Sapta was the uh, uh, fourth son or third son of, of Cush. And we talked a lot about this city called um, uh, Moreau. So Moreau was an ancient city on the east bank of the Nile, approximately 200 kilometers northeast of Katorum. Near the site is a group of villages and the city was the capital of the kingdom of Kush for several centuries around 590 BC until it's collapsed in the fourth century CE, okay? So Moreau is associated with uh, Sabta, which is associated with Kush. I'm going to share my screen again and show you Moreau. Can y'all see this? Okay. Yes. So this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
Moreau was an ancient city. What I read earlier was from Wikipedia. Again, all the references are here. Uh, ancient city of, of Kush, the ruins of which are located on the east bank of the Nile, four miles north of Kabu Hishia in the present day Sudan. Okay. So again, all of these locations all have Kushite associations, all of which are in Africa. All right. Uh, Saptaka is the next son. Um, there was a 25th dynasty pharaoh who ruled Egypt, but originated in Kush, who was called Shabituku. He ruled at the start of the 7th century BC, the very century that Genesis was compiled. The Hebrew author or compiler would have been inspired by the dynasty, which was an ally of Israel and named one of the sons of Cush after the Pharaoh. This is conjecture, but this is intelligent conjecture. Okay. There's not a lot of information about the son named Satika. Rama, the precious stones and gold sound, uh, uh, excuse me, the precious stones and gold uh, sound like the gold, uh, sound rather like the gold and different kinds of precious stones uh, of Moro Island, also the gold and Delhi and Onyx of Genesis 2. Again, so Rama is in the same region. And it makes sense, right? So if Cush is the father of the nation and he has children, his descendants are going to live near where they were born, right? And so we see these associations with as we travel further south along the eastern part of Africa, showing how these locations, and been particularly around the Nile, these locations are all associated with Kush. Okay, so I may have gone overboard with the evidence, but um, you just, I think it's important to have more information than not enough information, or too much than not enough. Moving on, Sheba. Uh, we mentioned before about the Atbara is the modern name of the Astaboras. Uh, and the supposed location uh, is right in the neighborhood to have inspired Rama as, uh, as an ancestor. Rama's two sons are listed as Sheba and Dedan. Ezekiel 27, 22 makes it clear that Sheba was near Rama and thus Havilah. Psalm 72.10 is also of interest in this respect. The kings of Tarshish and the Isle shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. These verses distinguishes Sheba from Seba clearly. This verse strongly suggests that Sheba shares a border with Seba, which again implies that Sheba was near Mero Island, which Siva was associated with. This is in agreement with our analysis of Ezekiel 27, 12, where we conclude that the gold and precious stones of the merchants of Shiva and Rama strongly suggest uh, the uh, Moro Island was in the same region. An obvious consequence of this analysis uh, is that we have to alter our South Arabian perception of the Queen of Sheba episode. Now, here, the author is saying that at this point, all other associations that we've made reference to Arabia have to be dispelled. The author goes on to say, it would appear that this Sheba was from Cush. The Sheba mentioned with Rama in Ezekiel 27, 22 is obviously from Cush because his son and grandson are mentioned together. The products mentioned in connection with this Sheba, spices, precious stones, and gold, are identical to the products the Queen of Sheba brought to Solomon. Okay. And the Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to prove him with hard questions, it says uh, in 1 Kings, I believe. 
And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones in 1 Kings, uh, Kings, again, chapter 10, verse 1. So these kings that brought the precious gifts were black? Yes. And they brought them to Solomon. Okay. Right. I have a question. Yes. And, um, okay, keep, when you make reference to the island of Moreau, which is um, near the, you know, Sudan, where exactly on the map, where is an island within oh, Africa? Exactly. So that's a great question. I think it's called the island of Moreau, not because it is an island. So that is just what they called it. Okay. It's, there's actually, I'm not looking at it right now, but I'm trying to think from memory. Um, South, um, East Africa, there's some clusters of um, islands. Do you have a, mo a modern map, Lewis? Uh, um, Southeast, and there is a Moreau, uh, uh, similar to, you know, you've seen the movie, The Island of the Doc of Dr. Moreau. Um, well, I was going to, I was going to show you this and maybe this will help, help clear it up. Uh, <laughs> I want to share. Well, you're saying, Pastor, it could be one of those. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain um, Southeast when I'm saying southeast, it may be a little bit north or um, more northeast. Yeah. So let me go back. You see Moreau. There, yeah, go sits, ahead. It's right here. This is where Moreau sits. Uh, uh, show, yeah, show the map. Yeah. And the body of water is the now that it's next to? Yes. Yes. All right. Let's see if I can show. Oh. Ah, it keeps removing the row off of the uh, off of the map. But to the to my point is. It sits right here, Northeast Africa. Uh, all right. Any other questions? Nope. All right. So, um, so. Sheba, as we've made, as we've shown, <clears throat> has an Kushite association. Um, and she, being the queen, came and uh, to Israel to talk to Solomon because she heard, heard of his wisdom. And she brought with her uh, resources that are interestingly found in the same place where Eden is. Now, Lewis, I don't, and I don't want to jump ahead of you, so stop me if I'm jumping ahead of you, okay? Um, there is a, uh, now, if you recall from, and I don't know if you, you put the link out there for the, uh, the documentary on the rescue of the Ethiopian Jews, right? Yeah. Uh, but you guys will watch that soon. Yep. And... And they have long claimed, and they have documented his uh, 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 a documented um, record yep. and, and evidence that they were descendants of Sheba, yep, and Solomon. So Solomon, when she, when she went to visit Solomon, they hooked up. Oh, there, okay. There, there, there is a. There is, and if you watch the documentary, you see that. There's a connection there. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, let's, do, let's not be surprised. We see often Hebrews that have commingled with, uh, with, uh, with descendants of Ham, right? So, um, firstly, 
we have Abraham going into Hagar. She was Egyptian, right? We have, um, I think, the wife that uh, Abraham had after Sarah died was also of Hamitic blood. We have Judah, one of the sons of, of Israel, uh, uh, having having children from uh, from uh, uh, Hamitic blood. The um, oh, what was I trying to say? So there's a lot of evidence that shows that there's been a, a bunch of crossover between between uh, Shemites and Hamites. Mm -hmm. And it's common, it's, it's normal. It's, yeah. All right, I'm aware of the time at 757. Let me finish this one section here and um, I'll put this out for you to read the remainder of it, uh, where I just I talk about the rivers of Eden in more detail. Uh, again, uh, is anyone that would can anyone say that at least from a, a, a documentation perspective that that it has not been demonstrated that Eden is in Africa? Have I proved that Eden resides in Africa? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Is it or is anybody not convinced that Eden is in Africa? The reason why this is important, part of the remember what we talked about last week was everyone agrees that civilization began in Africa. For us as believers, we understand that civilization began um, and God put put the man in a garden that was east of where he was created. Mm -hmm. So we're just connecting these dots. So the world thinks that civilization began on the continent of Africa, and that is substantiated uh, because the scripture had already said that. The scripture gives details about where Eden resides. To the mm -hmm. with we know it has a Cushite association because Cush's children are associated with Eden and those rivers. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So last thing, I'm I'm just gonna finish up. Uh, I'll read this here. We should conclude on the basis of geographical common sense and the biblical evidence that the Dan, like uh, Rama and Sheba, is in the neighborhood of Moreau Island, and its gold, silver, and all sorts of precious stones mentioned by Diodorus. What in quote? But he's in the he's in he's in the article here. Uh, we note, however. Uh, that silver does not occur in Strobe's quoted account, we keep reading, uh, or from Genesis 2's occurrence uh, concerning Havilah. However, Ezekiel is rather reminiscent in connection these Cushites with Tarshish and Sheba and Dedan. The merchants of Tarshish will bring the young lions. Uh, uh, that's not the section I want to read. But the point is, is that Silver, gold, delium, onyx, all of this is associated with Havilah. Havilah is the child of Cush. Cush is the child of Ham. Ham is the progenitor of the black races, not the Negroes. Yes. Did y'all catch that? Yes. Say that, again. say that one more time for people yeah. in the book. All right, so I'll, 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 I'll say the whole thing. <laughs> so all of this gold, silver, and precious stones have an association with Havilah. Havilah was a river specifically mentioned uh, as running uh, along and through uh, Eden, uh, which has a Cushite association, right? Because Havilah is the son of Cush, and Cush is the son of Ham, and Ham is the progenitor of the black races, not the Negroes. That's that, that there, what you just said? <laughs> That's going to be the... Yeah. That's going to be the part that we take out to promote this. Um, no, no, no. This is Zondervan, this is Zondervan Bible Dictionary. I, I have, yeah. I have that. Zondervan yeah. says, "Ham <laughs> is the progenitor of the black races, 
not the Negroes. Not the Negroes. Sondervan Bible Dictionary, which is a right. European publication. Just, I'm just saying. Amazing. <laughs> this is who Good. are the Negroes? Good. Okay. We're going to tune into that on a future session. <laughs> now, you, you said, you mentioned Arabia, and um, this is food for thought for y'all to kind of think about. First of all, did y'all watch all those videos or no? Yes, not finished. You're finished? Okay, so you're not finished. Okay, okay. Um, all right. Well, I would I would recommend that y'all go back. It some of them are you really gotta digest it. You really gotta digest it. And some of them I had to watch kind of several times over just to it was so meaty with information. And I wanted to make sure that I heard what I heard. Um you know, but when you look at Arabia, the way Arabia looks right, uh, or, or the Middle East looks right now, or that part of the world looks right now, is not what it looked like then. Even those people were um, darker complected people. Mm -hmm. Y'all clear on clear on that? I mean, we're going to prove that as we go as we go on. I, I'm going right. to. I'm going to prove to you with with archaeological, biological evidence that they look one and the same. They look one and the same. They, share they look one and the same. All right. But as a as a teaser, that's why you see that's why Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him. Because they look so, one. And the same. That's yeah. why, that's why when the daughters of the priests of Median said when he asked, "Hey, how did I get home so quick?" They said an Egyptian helped us. That was Moses. Moses wasn't Egyptian. Wow. Okay. I'm just saying. They they look yes. oh my one and the same. They look one and the same. And they said that's why um, God told, um, or the angel told them Joseph and Mary to go into Egypt because they could hide in Egypt. There it is. They could in and they, they couldn't have gone down there white. They there it is. They would stand out. <laughs> they would. Sore thumbs. Absolutely. Yes, they would. Like here, 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 here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And they couldn't find nowhere to stay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So they're, they're they're one and the same, but we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna talk all about that as we go on. So uh so I'm gonna conclude here. Next week when we get together, we're gonna be we're gonna talk post flood starting in Genesis chapter 10. Next week, I'm going to prove to you who the Gentiles are. Uh, I'm going to prove to you who the Gentiles are not. Okay. I'm going to, uh, we're going to talk about where people settle. We've already kind of talked about it so far, just uh, as, a, as a consequence, talking about Eden. Uh, Ham, we know, uh, settled or um, Africa. We'll talk about Shem and we'll talk about JPEG. So next week's study is the Table of Nations, Genesis 10. Genesis 10. All right. Any final thoughts or questions? <laughs>